Welcome everyone to the Mind of Christ here on YouTube. My name is Justin Amos and I am so excited for today because I am joined by my good friend Dave Parrish and we're going to be discussing the important topic of spiritual abuse. Dave, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, you bet. Glad to be here, Justin. Looking awesome. forward to our conversation. Well, I met Dave um, last August in Southern California as we are both in the same counseling program and he struck me immediately as someone with a gentle soul, but also someone that was in a season of pretty severe struggling with his time working in ministry. And so I kind of knew at some point I wanted to get him on my channel to discuss this topic of spiritual abuse. Perhaps you've heard it called a uh, religious trauma or church trauma. We're going to be diving headfirst into it today. So David, before we begin, I would love for you just to take a minute or two and just Tell our viewers a little bit just about your life, your family, and just some of your uh, education and some of your background experience working in ministry and in churches. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So um, my family and I live in the, the Omaha, Nebraska area. I have been a pastor for about 22 years now. Um, I'm a minister of word and sacrament in the Reformed Church in America. And I really wanted to get into pastoral ministry to be with people and uh, uh honestly, to be on the front lines of seeing God change people's lives as uh, they let Jesus in and draw closer to him. Um, I uh, went to college and uh, studied psychology and theology. After college, went right into seminary and got a Master of Divinity degree. Um, 20 years later, uh, almost to, to the day, I completed a Doctor of Ministry degree. And over the years, I've served uh four different churches so and in different roles. Uh, solo pastor of a small church in Wisconsin, associate pastor at a church in the Chicago area. We've been in the Omaha area for almost 10 years now. Um, and I was the uh, solo pastor at a 15-year-old church. And then my most recent church was in a different denomination. Um, and I was uh, associate pastor role, worked in spiritual formation there. Um, my wife, Amy, uh, actually has some background in church health, too. She's an attorney. Her first job was at a law firm that worked with nonprofits, and uh, they did a, one seminar for churches called the Legal Checkup Seminar, where they would talk about best practices for churches. Um, Right now, I'm uh, not working at a church, focusing on the school program and uh, also looking to do some, some coaching as an Enneagram coach uh, to work um, in spiritual direction and, and pastoral counseling while I complete the uh, master's in clinical mental health counseling. Awesome, man. Awesome. Dave also has uh, an LLC called Fruitful Life that he alluded to a minute ago, where he offers kind of spiritual direction, um, pastoral counseling, and really just help with kind of navigating your struggles, looking at your future, um, some of your hopes in life. And if you're in a crisis, man, he would be a great resource for you. So I will post uh, Dave's contact um, info below in the description. And if you are interested in kind of checking in with Dave or just having someone to kind of partner with you and come alongside you and wherever you find yourself in life, I know Dave would be honored to join you on that journey. So definitely check out Fruitful Life and Dave's ministry there. All right, man. So let's dive into kind of my first um, question. I remember uh, just a very vivid memory of you and I in Southern California. We were on the bus either going to or from uh, Concordia University's campus in Irvine. And I remember sitting next to you and you said, hey, man, I have a favor to ask of you. I said, okay. And you said, I need you to keep telling me stories about your church. As I had been kind of just sharing some encouraging things going on and some of the health taking place in our church. And that struck me. It was encouraging to hear that from my perspective, like, wow, like sounds like my church is on the right track. And, but it was a pretty clear indicator that you were not in a healthy place and that there were some pretty destructive things going on in your life and specifically in your church culture and leadership that you were in and the, yeah, the church culture you were working in. So why don't you give us a little bit of context into what you were going through at that time in your life? Yeah, I remember that conversation well. We had just come out of a process group, and our task was to find someone um, within our group or um, at the experience with us to share something we needed. 
And um, I think I had maybe told you a little bit about my church before that, and um, I could just tell we had very different experiences of it. So um, I wanted to, uh, I was jealous of things happening at your church. I thought this is really different from the church I'm in. And I thought, I don't want to be jaded by this. Um, He loves his church. Great things are happening. And um, I need just to hear that there are some good churches that are doing great things um, around there. Um, So uh, just to kind of catch up on where I was, and that was a a low spot in life that uh, became even lower as the next few months unfolded. Um, I'd been at the church about five years, completed the Doctor of Ministry in Soul Care and Spiritual Formation, and um, just really wasn't sure what was next. I didn't have a sense that the church really valued. um, Actually, I think the church valued what I was bringing and even some of the board members. But um, there was just something in my relationship with the lead pastor that seemed really off. Um, I looked around a little for another position and didn't find anything and and had no need to go into anything else. Um, And that was the time that I uh, enrolled in the counseling program, started to look into that. And um, I wasn't sure at the time if I would use it within a church ministry setting, or um, I also knew it would be a viable alternative for some kind of work um, if I needed to get out of church ministry. Um, Well, just a few months before we left, and I don't want to make this the focal point, but um, something major happened, and I just knew I wasn't right. I knew that the church setting wasn't right. Um, Completely out of the blue, Super Bowl Sunday, maybe even when the Chiefs won, not sure. Uh, (laughs) But it was uh, the the day after Super Bowl Sunday, um, we held our uh, usual staff meeting, and just completely out of nowhere, the lead pastor announced that he was going to be getting divorced after 38 years of marriage. Um, Nobody saw it coming, completely blindsided all of us. Um, He handed out a letter that would be going out to the congregation later that week, kind of did a quick, any questions, collected the letters so he could shred them. after that meeting and uh, then just kind of uh, expected everyone to be okay with that announcement. And up until that point, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the structure, the governance, the functioning of the church. Um, Again, I was a pastor in a different denomination and I started uh, in a a part-time contract role and had a lot of trust that they were on the up and up, that they were people of integrity, that there were checks and balances in place. And as the next couple of weeks played out, I realized um, that, uh, at, at least as I saw it, the church council Um, didn't see any role of holding accountability for the lead pastor. Um, In conversations with them, I'd hear things like, well, that's too bad, or, um, you know, what would we do about it if if this happened at my job? Um, I'd have no role in any kind of accountability. And I thought, you know, the Bible kind of has some things to say about um, good leadership, about (laughs) qualifications for leadership, disqualifications. And um, as I uh, started to pay more attention, I thought, well, this really just doesn't seem right. Um, Even to the point I, uh, at a meeting, said, I think the congregation needs to hear a message from the board, some kind of a letter. And the lead pastor went to his office five minutes later, called me in and said, hey, does this sound like what the uh, congregation needs to hear from me? And I thought, that's not uh, what I had in mind. I was thinking maybe the council would actually write this letter. Um, and that was the point where I thought, I, you know, I don't think that they're um, having any hard conversations there. Mm-hmm. Um, as it played out, a couple of other staff members left. And um, I, uh, as uh, we got to the end of last year, I saw what seemed to me like some retaliation through the review process. And I just knew in good conscience, I could not stay there and be part of that, um, that church any longer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sounds like definitely some, some cover up, some manipulation. Hey, let's just downplay this and sweep it under the rug and move on. And to you, you know, the, the lights, the the sirens are going off. Hey, this is not right. This is not normal. This is not how we handle this. Scripture is pretty clear on we, how we handle things like this. And so that didn't sit well with your spirit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And around that time, I think this is kind of important and maybe seems ironic too. Uh, my advisor for my doctor of ministry program um, is uh, Reverend Dr. Chuck DeGroat, who some yeah. of the viewers might recognize him yeah. as the author of When Narcissism Comes to Church. 
And um, I had an advanced copy to read and uh, to do some promotion when it came out in March 2020. And as I read it, I thought, oh, this is really bad. And I'm glad I'm not in a church like that. And then um, last spring, I pulled it out again and uh, started highlighting things on the, the ebook. And just about every page of that book gave me um, some context for understanding. And I went from the, oh boy, I'm glad I'm not in that to, oh wow, this is really bad. And I'm uh, right in that kind of a situation right now. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, man, for sharing that. All right, man. So my next question is, what has been, would you say, just the most challenging part of navigating some of the spiritual abuse that you experienced and just being a part of a pretty unhealthy church culture? Yeah, um, there's a lot of ways I could answer that. Um, going back to the day after the announcement of the divorce, I woke up that next morning and I thought, I am just not well right now. Uh, this is bizarre. I don't understand all that's going on. And as I um, came to explore it more, I found that that's kind of a, a natural trauma response, that um, trauma is a body's response to threat. And in the absence of, of safety, uh, the body has a few different ways that it responds. Um, so, uh, you know, looking back, I now have a better understanding of it. Um, I uh, had a few conversations with people and tried to, um, you know, I guess you could say lead from second chair and just try to get some background and get some perspective on it. Um, I had found that in the previous experiences, talking with the lead pastor was just really pretty unproductive. In my experiences with him, um, every element of emotional abuse was there. So there'd be high defensiveness. There'd be um, gaslighting, you know, getting me to question my reality. Um, anytime any concern was raised, uh, he was, uh, uh, as I saw it, really uh, quick to point out how everyone else contributed and didn't actually take any ownership of it himself. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, just a lot of control, a lot of manipulation. And the church, to their credit, decided that they would try to um, address it. Um, not directly. Um, and, and just a component of it was uh, in, in reality, there was no accountability for the lead pastor. Um, he kept bringing up a phrase called mutual accountability, and we never had any uh, real definition of what that meant. Um, and um, it just uh, really wasn't a, a helpful accountability structure. So um, around the time you and I had met, the church was getting ready to enter into a church health, um, organizational health process. So I was uh, encouraged by some members of the board to just hang on. They said, we're going to address this. This is going to get better. Um, you know, you can be part of the solution here. And um, looking back now, I realized it was something, uh, that, at least as I see it, something much deeper than church health was needed. Um, I like to think of it as um, if you have cancer, it's not going to hurt you at all to start a better diet and get out and do some exercise. Uh, but unless you address the cancer that's there, you're really not going to get to the root of it. Um, so. Mm. Yeah, it just was, it was really frustrating to try to say, hey, I have some background in this. I have some experience in this. Um, I've been around the, the church health and understanding church systems and have done some extra work in that field. And um, I just uh, overall felt devalued uh, as, as a person um, and just also felt that they didn't value the experience and, and the, you know, I would say expertise and some of these topics. So, yeah. um, you know, it took a toll on my mental health. I didn't sleep well for most of a year. Um, mm -hmm. And I just felt really trapped. Um, and I remember a, a week or two before I decided that I needed to get out of there, uh, just feeling a real sense of relief and a sense of freedom that, uh, that there was an end in sight. Um, I'd love to say it's been great since that time, but um, as uh, uh, I, I'm in a trauma course right now, learning about complex mm. trauma, and um, I think I'm experiencing most of what what that means. Um, and you don't just snap out of it. You don't just move on. I had people uh, within the church saying, "Well, you got to forgive. Uh, you got to let it go." 
and um, which is really just the opposite of what uh, you should do with someone who's going through uh, through the symptoms of trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, man. Thank you. Yeah. It's kind of some of the responses some Christians give that are meant to be helpful, but are actually quite hurtful. Right. Yeah. And in yeah. some ways it was spiritual bypassing, you know, putting a nice Christian smile on it instead of really actually um, doing the lamenting that the Psalms get yeah. into and, and actually doing some deep work around it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Dave, sometimes when you're in um, an unhealthy or abusive relationship, reality can be pretty distorted and you can question yourself and question what's true. And it can be really tough, especially if you've been brainwashed by someone for an extended period of time. And so I know there's going to be viewers watching this that might be or find themselves in somewhat of a similar situation working with someone. It might not even be in a church setting. It could be, but working with someone that is really difficult and challenging and they're questioning reality and they feel like they've been brainwashed, um, but they're just not sure because that person's really, um, you know, persuasive and really good at convincing them that they're the problem. So what would you say are some clear indicators or warning signs to people watching that they might be in fact experiencing spiritual abuse? Yeah, I wish I didn't uh, have some answers to share with you, but I've had a lot of firsthand experiences with that. Um, some of it is just uh, shame and, and self-blame, like what's wrong with me? Um, why am I reacting this way? Why can't I let it go? Why can't I be okay with what I'm seeing and understanding as a, a very toxic church system? Um, I was... Uh, you know, really upset about it. I think righteous anger around what I was experiencing within the church. Um, I had uh, even a, a a family member say to me, "You know, what's wrong with you? Uh, what?" And uh, this was kind of afterward, as this person knew more of the story. Um, but they just kind of thought I I snapped, and mm -hmm. um, I've never really had any reactions like I've had within this situation. Um, I get along with, with just about everybody. And um, I just didn't, I didn't feel like myself. And I had other people who were um, uh, uh, some close friends saying, you know, this is not a good situation for you to be in. So um, yeah. I'd say that's the main thing. When I didn't feel like I could show up as my own authentic self, that I needed to uh, play a role and, and uh, act in a certain way, um, that's when I knew that it wasn't a good situation. I would hear people say about the lead pastor, well, you know, that's just who he is. And they would talk about him being really charming and uh, that he was really charismatic. And, um, you know, I looked at it and, and I just thought um, these people are, are just being played by someone who's really uh, manipulative. And, and what really helped me make sense of it um, somewhere along the way, I stumbled onto a uh, YouTuber, uh, Dr. Ram Ramani, um, or Ramani, and yeah. um, as I started watching her videos, I just thought, that's it. Um, so without the, the knowledge and the background that she gave, um, and she talks about uh, emotional abuse and what that looks like, uh, more so in, in marriage relationships, romantic relationships, uh, but it has a lot of, of relevance because, um, you know, people are fairly consistent in their work relationships and um, romantic relationships, family relationships. And um, yeah, so just a lot of, uh, of consistency there. Yeah. Two key things I heard there. One is maybe when you're, when you find yourself with a group of people or working with someone where you can't be who you are, that the, the person God made you to be and let your characteristics and strengths shine. Um, when you feel like you have to be someone else, that's a, that's a warning sign. And then number two, when some trusted people in your life are saying, Hey man, something's off. You're different. You're uptight. You're rigid. You seem to be wallowing in shame. When, when some friends are saying something, that's a clear sign too. So those are pretty, those are pretty key, very practical things I think people can apply to if they're in a similar situation. So that's really helpful, man. Thank you. Yeah. yeah and uh, just another thought came to mind. Uh, there was a real sense of isolation within this too. And I've seen that 
written about in just about every place that I read about emotional abuse and spiritual abuse. Um, For us, it played out uh, just in the lead pastor controlling the narrative about uh, about everything. Um, It was rare for uh, the staff and the board to have any kind of a meeting together. And uh, as I see that, that was his way to control the narrative. And I think he would uh, pit the staff and council against each other sometimes. And um, even uh, they looked at uh, 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 establishing a triangulation policy that um, talking to anyone else about a concern um, would be a, a fireable offense or a very serious offense. And they ended up uh, putting a pause on that as we were heading into this org health process. But, um, you know, high control, high manipulation, um, low accountability, classic signs, what you'd see in uh, emotional abuse and spiritual abuse. Mm. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. Thank you. Well, man, my next question is kind of centered for people that might be watching here who find themselves in a situation where they are the victim perhaps of spiritual or emotional abuse. What would your message be to someone watching that maybe finds themselves similar to a position situation you were in a year or two ago? What advice, what hope would you give them as, um, yeah, they're tuning in right now? Yeah. A whole bunch of things come to mind as I consider that. Um, one is pay attention to yourself, pay attention to your body's responses to things. Um, there's a great book called The Body Keeps the Score, and uh, Bessel van der Kolk is the author of that, and he talks about trauma responses and um, how that shows up in unexpected ways. So pay attention to yourself. Um, and I would say trust your gut on things. If something doesn't seem right, uh, there's a good reason for that. And maybe maybe you're misreading it, but when you keep getting that same uh, hunch or that same gut feeling about it, it's like, no, there's something more that's going on here. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of self-care, um, whether it's uh, uh, breathing exercises or getting outside and running or whatever it might be. Um, and this might be the last one, uh, probably is at least the most important one, is to find some good people who you can talk to about it. Uh, one of the big emphasis uh, of, of the program that we're in, Learning to Counsel, is to uh, develop solid relationships with other people. And when I think about um, the isolation that was being uh, forced upon me within the church environment, uh, I had such a rich community of people to call upon. Um, I've got a friend who uh, we've been friends our entire lives, so over four decades that we've known each other. And he's a pastor, and um, we were able to bounce some ideas off of each other. Uh, For me, I had fairly recently completed the Doctor of Ministry degree, which was a cohort approach. So I had uh, some friends, some great colleagues who I was able to to talk to. Um, And, uh, you know, you, Justin, were were a real gift in my life at just that Mm -hmm. time. Someone who was uh, so far removed from it. You um, had no connections to it, but uh, you were familiar with pastoral work and some of the challenges of it. So um, I've really Mm -hmm. enjoyed our friendship along the way. And Mm -hmm. um, my wife's belief in uh, in me and and my read and and our take on things and uh, with her background in uh, law and uh, her work with churches and knowledge of best practices. you know, I, 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 every temptation there was for me to think I'm misreading this when I looked into it more, as I talked with other people about it, as I uh, learned more about church dynamics and um, also emotional abuse. I'm just uh, for me, it, it was uh, it was was uh, very clear of what I was experiencing at the time. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, man, for sharing that and for your kind words to me. That means a lot, bro. Well, Dave, so my last question for you is kind of centered towards pastors, um, elders, and church leaders. What what advice or encouragement would you give them knowing that their leadership and their influence is pretty profound and runs deep? And every day 
here in the United States and around the world, they're impacting millions and hundreds of millions of people. So what advice would you give to Christian leaders and the importance of taking their mental and emotional health and spiritual health very seriously? Yeah, and impact was the word that came to mind for me. Um, For all the church leaders who are watching, think about the considerable impact that what you do, how you operate, how you respond to concerns that are raised. Think about the impact of that on other people. Um, In my situation, um, I just seem to think that the, the board thought I was making it up. I didn't think they took my concerns seriously, which um, plays out as uh, re-victimization and, and re-traumatization. Um, you know, I, again, had a, a have a doctor of ministry degree and have spent considerable time working on church health. And um, uh, I just uh, experienced more gaslighting in my conversations with them. Um, on my way out, I actually requested that they do a third party independent investigation. And um, as I saw it, that was really uh, what I saw as their best chance to get to the heart of what was going on and, uh, you know, put all the cards on the table and see what they were working with. And uh, their first response to that was, well, we can't afford that. We don't have the money for that. And I'd say you can't afford not to um, hmm. investigate the concerns. Um, wow. And uh, ironically, and this is kind of a kick in the gut to me, um, even though they didn't have money at the time to investigate the concerns I raised, um, right now they're looking into raising money to have volleyball courts and grills and an amphitheater on the property. So for me, that says a lot about what their priorities are. Um, wow. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, I'd say, again, take these concerns very seriously. They promised me that they would, um, but um, as I see it, they just seem to dismiss them pretty quickly, even when I tried to bring um, a higher level of the denomination into it. So take the concerns seriously. Think about the impact that you're having on others um, and uh, set proper accountability structures in place Um, I like to think uh, that even within a church, everybody should have somebody who can fire them um, (laughs) because without that, there really is no accountability. And as I've tried to make sense of all of this, I've uh, looked just in the last couple of days at Ezekiel 34, where the prophet Ezekiel talks about the bad shepherds. And uh, if I could read a little of it, this sounds like spiritual abuse. Uh, Ezekiel said, uh, woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with wool, slaughter the choice animals, but do not take care of the flock. You've not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You've not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. And those words just broke my heart. Uh, They've not searched for the lost. People are leaving churches because of the abuse, because of hypocrisy, because of of corruption, because of inauthenticity, and the actions of church leaders matter. Um, And as that passage continues, God says, I will hold you accountable. And he says, for those who've left, for those who've walked away, um, I I will shepherd you. And uh, that's kind of where where my family is right now. We've been attending another church, but um, I really have a hard time trusting any church leaders right now based on that last experience Um, in it. um, I just, though, keep drawing nearer to Jesus and look to him as the good shepherd in the Mm -hmm. face of uh, abusive, abusive and toxic shepherds. Yeah. Amen. Well, man, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for your heart to see people healed and to see people grow and flourish. And man, I want nothing for the best for you as you and your family continue this journey that might be rough for a little while longer as you recover from some of the spiritual abuse and trauma that you guys endured. And so I know you though, and I know that you're leaning into Christ and you're surrounding yourself with godly people who are speaking truth to you and who are willing to call you out maybe when you're acting crazy or when you're out of line. And so, um, I just appreciate you, Dave, and I thank you for your work, and I hope some people watching will hit you up for some spiritual direction, life coaching, um, or just pastoral counseling, because I know you would be a great friend and resource to them. So again, man, cannot thank you enough, David, for your time. Thanks, Justin. 
Appreciate the conversation. You bet, man. Take care. God bless. Thanks. You too.